Well, okay, a, a formal welcome to everybody. Um, and I'll be handing over to Dr. Sally Green, our speaker, to talk about the mines of Shropshire very soon. But just before I do, I'd like to say a brief word about CPRE for those who don't already know us that well. CPRE is the countryside charity with a national office of paid staff who lobby government and there are branches in almost every English county of which CPRE Shropshire is one. Our aim is to protect the countryside, including from inappropriate development. We have a part-time paid branch manager, Sarah Jameson, who we must thank because she's the person that set up this entire evening. Um, uh, but the rest of CPRE are all volunteers. We work closely with neighbouring counties, including some in Wales on cross-border matters, particularly at the moment on river pollution, which is one of my own uh, personal concerns. As well as keeping an eye on planning matters, uh, we have also thanks to Sarah in particular for a very effect, a very active and effective hedgerow campaign. Um, and it's probably one of the best that exists throughout the whole of England. We've worked extensively uh, for the last two years, raising awareness of the hedgerow's value to both us and wildlife through education, practical hedgerow care, and including planting several miles of hedgerows. And we hope that will carry on and we'll be doing the same thing in 2024. You can learn more about CPRE Shropshire on our hedgerow campaign by visiting cpreshropshire.org.uk or just Google us. Having said all that, I'd now like to give a brief introduction on tonight's speaker. Um, Dr. Sally Green, who I know is known as Sally to many of you, um, has had a lifelong interest in geology and mineralogy. Despite this, she became a doctor in uh, paediatrics and general practice, but retired and moved in 2006 from Wantage in Oxfordshire to husband Charles's inherited 17th century farmhouse at Maysbrook. She and Charles became active in CPRE soon afterwards and then took over the joint chairmanship of the Oswestry district in 2014. This is now Sally's third annual talk on the geology of Shropshire, and at least two more are planned on building stones and then fossils. Uh, as I'm restoring an old farmhouse, I shall be really interested in the building stones one. The previous two talks on the geological history of the county and on the Ice Age are still available on YouTube, um, and this one will be as well. Sally, Sally's aim remains to expand um, public education about geology and teach people how to read the landscape by knowing how it is formed and what lies beneath, including mine, the mining legacy. Um, and it's that very subject that we'll be talking about this evening. Um, she hopes you'll enjoy this talk and please put any questions in the chat, lot, uh, chat box as we go along. So without uh, any further introductions, Sally, I'd like to hand over to you and let's hear this absolutely fantastic talk. Well, indeed. I felt this evening I needed to come dressed appropriately. So I am um, dressed to go down the mine. Um, thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, it's very nice to see you all and very nice that you uh, feel you can come and listen many of you again. Um, and I hope you've done your homework um, because an understanding of the amazing geological history of Shropshire is, is pretty central to why we host so many um, economically um, valuable minerals. Right, I'm going to We're take going my to hat off. Screen share, but Sarah, you've disabled screen sharing. Oh dear. Oh God, can't not not deliberately, Charles. Um, let me see. There. there we go. That should be possible now. That's it. That's right. That's Sorry it. about right. that. Okay, I'll come out the mine. So here we go. If I just get the slideshow started. Slideshow from beginning. Okay, we're off. Good, good. Mine is held it off now, you see. First thing, please. Thank you. Well, um, we might think in this day and age that we're very threatened with uh, all sorts of developments in our countryside and that we're going to hell in a handcart and all things are terrible. But 
I think we need to bear in mind that what, what we're going through now is actually as of nothing. So what people had to cope with in the 18th and 19th century, um, they'd been through the process of enclosure, which altered the landscape vastly and the econo economics of the country. Um, but uh, in the 18th and 19th century, um, there was a radical change in the in the um, the the the, uh, the the face of the countryside, particularly here in Shropshire. And I'm sure you're all aware that Shropshire is world famous as the cradle of the Industrial Revolution, most of which is down to this gentleman here, Abraham Darby. Um, who was born in 1678 uh, in Sedgley in the West Midlands and came from a tradition of iron working. Um, and in 1709, after a spell working in Bristol, he landed here in Ironbridge um, to help out um, at um, a, a furnace which was already operating in Colbrookdale. And he was the first really to pioneer the use of coke um, instead of timber and charcoal for smelting iron, which was absolutely fundamental to the mass production of, of, of iron and uh, the way in which it was, it was um, smelted and used for making pots and pans, generally small things. Um, now he was actually lived a very short life if you do your maths here. He was in, in his late thirties, he became ill. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it's no coincidence that he worked in a very, very hot and unhealthy environment, but he died and his son, Abraham Darby II took over and further refined his um, smelting techniques. I haven't got a picture of him here because he wasn't, absolutely central, but the third Abraham Darby, uh, who was born long after Abraham Darby first had died, but the second one also lived a very short life. Abraham Darby the third was the man who actually built the Iron Bridge. And he, um, he was, was absolutely um, brilliant and uh, he, he lived in an age when Shropshire was very, was full of iron masters. There were furnaces all over the, the area that's now iron, uh, now Telford. Um, and he, he um, realized that you could make bigger structures with iron. So along with um, uh, an engineer, he fashioned this fantastic bridge you see in the bottom right hand corner, which of course has lasted to this very day. He did work with Thomas Telford, who was the county surveyor at that time, and they built another bridge at Bildwas, but that unfortunately didn't stand the test of time and, and collapsed. So, but but the um, the modern mine, the, the iron bridge you see, has, has lasted now for however many years is it? Um, 240. 240 years. Uh, it's just been repainted and restored and is looking very splendid, worth a visit. But I'm sure you all know all about this. Um, but it all depends on the fact that it was discovered that the Ironbridge Gorge hosts four absolutely vital minerals all in one place, which is, of course, iron, coal, Limestone, which was used as a flux in the um, um, furnaces, and other things such as fire clay and tar. Uh, so it was an absolutely amazing conjunction of all these different minerals. So carry on. Right. Okay, I'm just going to show you a few pictures of sort of then and now to press home the point that um, the landscape, which of course CPR is, is uh, dedicated to, um, the, the landscape has so totally changed. Well, here's Granville Mine, which was the last deep mine to exist in Telford, which um, ceased functioning in the early 60s. 
Uh, this was the last word in coal mining. It was by then a very deep mine. They chased all the seams down right very, very low. Um, and of course, um, the, it was beginning to be worked out, but it, it had amalgamated with other mines and it was going, but, but at that time, the demand for coal was beginning to dwindle. Realization was beginning to happen that it wasn't really that uh, good a fuel. Uh, the, the picture next to it is of Hanwood Colliery, the pit head of it in 1920. That was the largest mine in the Shrewsbury coal field, about which more in a bit. Um, went through through a number of stages. And below you see what's happened now. Um, Trevonan, which is up in the Oswestry Hills, hosts uh, another coal field, which was worked for centuries. And now we're reduced to um, a playing field in the middle of the village with a very little sign of an old coal pit. You can see that it's coal. In fact, I've actually got some coal right here. Where are we? Ooh. Doesn't show. Oh yes, there we are. A piece of coal from that very pit. I can't really see that though because you're in a small screen. Oh, okay. Um, and and this uh, to on bottom right, Muxton Mine. This is um this is a south north east corner of Telford, uh, rapidly being built over by modern boxes, obliterating a lot of the features. Uh, and here we have some more sort of then and now, we have um, um, the Nags Head Mine, which is in the Shrewsbury coal field, which is again, just a field, a playing field. And there was a, a shaft right in the middle of that field, completely disappeared. You would have no idea. Uh, uh, below we see another bit, well, this is another building area still being built on the old coal mine in uh, Telford. Top right, we went to visit the Gravels Lead Mine um, on Gold Cup Day, and we found three entries for the Gold Cup who persistently bothered us, wandering around on the spoil tips from this particular lead mine by the, by the road that goes through the Hope Valley. And below you see, well, very suburban looking garden, right in the middle of Snail Beach lead mine. So that's to show really how, what a difference the landscape is now. It's all gone tame, really. And uh, yes. Uh, yes, yeah. Carry on. Now what? I don't know what's happened here. Screen has stopped. Oh, yes. OK, well, let's have a quick um, revision of the geology of Shropshire, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with from my previous talk. But what I want you to look at mostly at the moment is this big, um, this uh, orange, orange area, which is the North Shropshire plain, for want of a better word, which, as you see, the green is um, the coal coal fields. And as you see, it sort of loops around and under. And if we were to add Cheshire and say uh, Staffordshire to this, you would see that this large Triassic sandstone basin, um, which filled up after the Carboniferous era, uh, it's like a great big saucer and the saucer itself is made of carboniferous rocks. On the far left, you see the, the light blue is the carboniferous limestone. And I'm sure you'll remember from your geology that, that, that during the carboniferous era, we were sitting the, 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 the area that's now uh, at 52 degrees north around there was then virtually on the equator. And the limestone formed in very shallow, very warm seas, much like Bahamas now which um, eventually um, deltas formed from the nearby land and formed the sandstones, this gray area, um, the Kefani Fedu and the, uh, it's got different names in different areas, but 
on those deltas, which were sort of low lying, eventually swamps formed and, and trees grew. And um, these trees were very abundant, died, formed peat, and then it would be inundated perhaps by the sea or by rivers, and then another lot would grow. And in this way, the, um, the coral seams formed. That was um, succeeded. At this time, there was um, a, another mountain building episode. We call it the um, Variscan or the quite, quite a few names, Hercinian. The, a, an ocean to the south of, of, of Britain closed, squashed the whole area up. And in places, the, um, the tectonics allowed parts to sink. The, 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 the crust sort of stretched. And at that point, all the continents joined together to form Pangaea, one huge continent, which we'd moved to north a bit by then. And it was a very desert-like um, climate. And so for the whole of the Permian and Triassic era, the area that is North Shropshire now was a huge desert full of you know, sand, sand dunes. Uh, there were flash flooded rivers, it was, so there were cobbles, but that sort of buried the, co the, the coal and this, this, this saucer, as I would call it. Um, and, and so that's really why we, ho we host a lot of coal fields because they were all squashed down and surrounded. And you'll see there's a basin to the far, so the far right is a far left, which is um, the Severn Valley that formed in a, another basin uh, with a lot of faulting between. Now on the right, you see a, a map which shows really where our mineral wealth lies. Now, um, across the north of the, across the Triassic Plain, um, we have a lot of copper mines, which were a bit surprising, almost in a line. Um, and uh, quite some of them really quite rich. And I'll tell you all about that in a while. But as you see, there are no fewer than six coal, coal fields. We host the, 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 the southern end of the Denbyshire coal field. Um, the, the, the biggest mines were around Ifton, St. Martin's Way, but further north at Wrexham, of course, it was a, a very uh, well-known coal field with a lot of, a lot of coal. Uh, and that peters out around Morda and um, Travon and Trevlach, that area where the mining is much smaller scale. And then we have this curious um, V-shaped coal field, which is the Shrewsbury coal field, only just detached from the Lee Botwood coal field, which pokes down into the Church Stretton Valley. That's again in a sort of low valley. Uh, and it goes to within a couple of miles of Church Stretton, surprisingly. These two coal fields uh, were, lit, were not particularly productive. It was upper coal. It was quite thin seams, really. I can actually show you a piece of it because I've got some I found. Um, and they were, but they were worked intensively for a very long time. And then on the far right, well, there was a very small detached piece of this coal field at Dryton, which is um, Eaton Constantine on the River Severn, which was mined a little bit, but it was never particularly important. Um, and, and then we, we see to the right of that is the big Colbrook, um, Colbrookdale coal field. I say big, it's actually not particularly big, but that is the most prolific coal field that gave rise to. It also hosts a lot of iron, iron um, deposits, and that's where really the most important coal field in the county is. And there's a little tail to that that goes past Bridge North, uh, right down to the south. And the Wire Forest is again the site of a very large, but rather poor and fairly shallow coal field. And then there's another very, very surprising coal field right at the top of both Clee Hills, lying underneath a capping of um, basalt. 
um, which sort of protected this coal field from erosion, really, I suppose, when the Tidston, Clee and Brown Clee Hills were uplifted. And they're made of old red sandstone, so they're, they're rocks much older. You see this, this um, red pinky uh, colour, that's old red sandstone. So that predates the Carboniferous and formed from the erosion from the Caledonian Mountains, which were formed a good deal earlier in the Silurian period, uh, when the two halves of Britain crashed together um, and the Yapetus Ocean cl closed, which again, I'm sure you, you know from my talk before. So carry on. Oh gosh. Ah. Don't worry, it's not working. <laughs> Uh, right. Needs some time to think. Well, here's another map of this area, which I'll return to a few few times just to um, locate them, because I'm going to talk about coal first, because it's rather important. Well, here we are having the coal forests. Um, the trees in those days, we call them trees, but they were actually not like modern trees. Um, bark hadn't really evolved. Uh, they were much like tree ferns, like the the sort of things you find in the tropics now, very um, softwood, so to speak, but with these, these lovely patterns on the trunks and fern-like fronds. And when they died, um, the sort of fungi that we have now that rot trees hadn't actually yet, yet evolved. So there's, there's quite a different way of... of a formation of, uh, of, of, there was no such thing as rotting in the sense that we know it now. These things just lay in, in the swamps. They're mare's tail like things. We still have a lot of these plants or similar plants now that have survived from the Carboniferous like ginkgo, but it was rather different, but very prolific, very fast growing. And so these forests blanketed everywhere. So as they fell, as you see from the right, they died and they formed peat, or what they call a peat. This got compressed as time went on and other um, sediments landed on top. Uh, and eventually, the one, the second one down is, is where it formed something called lignite, which is not really completely coal, but is still very um, burnable. And, the, uh, and Germany hosts a lot of lignite which they use for the power stations and the like, or used, don't anymore. Then as compression goes on and pressure and heat from all this uh, overlying and, and, and changes in the tectonics of the area, eventually it becomes bituminous. Um, so you'll get tars forming and volatiles like gases and steams and things. Um, it forms something called subbituminous coal, which is a good coal, but not top notch. But eventually, after many millions of years, it turns to anthracite, which is the best coal and is the shiny coal that we remember from our youth that would be sold probably by your uh, coal merchant. And that's very, very calorific. Um, well, okay. Yeah. So here are a few examples. Um, but in, in researching this talk, I find that there are many, many different types of coal. Coal isn't just coal. Coal is was good for certain um, purposes. So some coal might be have a lot of sulfur in it, which um, wasn't too good and would, would boil off. A lot of it would form a lot of gas of various sorts, methane. Um, so you know, the, 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 these these things, it's quite a, a big science, coal, but, um, and we must never forget that coal was not, is not just a fuel. It's been used for centuries for all sorts of other, other uh, purposes, which gets a bit lost in the current argument about going green because we need coal for dyes and um, chemicals and pharmaceuticals. It's got uses in many other ways. So it's an amazing substance, really. But, um, you know, we're moving on from it, really, we're leaving it there where it is. Carry yeah. on. Yeah. If you can. If I can. I know what's going to be Apologies. Technical hitch here again. Seems like time to think. 
Yes, well, here's a picture of a typical open cast mine and shows you really that mine comes in seams, which I'm sure you know, but uh, when the seams are quite near the surface, throughout history, it's been profitable just to scrape away the topsoils and access the seams um, straight away from the surface. And a lot of that's gone on in Shropshire about which more in a minute. Right now I'm going to show you this map because this is a map that was actually surveyed by the um, BGS, British Ge Geological Society, way back in 1855 when Henry de la Beche, who was a very famous geologist, was in charge. Um, and actually, I found these in the library and thought, well, they're really rather beautiful because they're all hand painted and they painted on these white lines, which are the, the faults. Now, they may not be totally accurate by modern standards, but we bear in mind that in 1855, it was extremely important that they got this right because an awful lot of livelihoods depended on knowing where the coal seams were. So this is a map of the Oswestry Hills, where, as you know, there were lime, the carboniferous limestone that forms this sort of um, S shape, for one of a better word, um, and the the coal the coal seams going off north towards uh, Wrexham. I just think they're rather beautiful. So I'm actually retro whatever to 1855 for most of this talk. So. <laughs> Apologies if uh, any high power geologists on the, the on the uh, talk think I'm talking a load of rubbish, but I think knowing the geology of Shropshire, these are pretty accurate on the whole. So that's yeah, I just think they're pretty, and they do show the topography. Now we're going to start with Ifton Colliery, which is the further the biggest colliery colliery in Shropshire in the Denbyshire coal field, and this is it. Um, during its heyday, probably. This was a very big mine, um, and at its peak, it did um, employ some something like um, 1,200 men, not all underground at the same time, um, and, and lasted right up to 1967, I think. Um, pass on, yeah. Um, the, the, we've been discovering this side-by-side -side mapping, which is all rather fun. So we're comparing now from the 1937 to 61 map, relatively um, modern, heyday. the heyday, I suppose, yes, with a with a much with an earlier map. And this shows quite clearly that the site of the colliery has changed; it's moved. And this is what happened with coal mining. You'd, you'd, you'd send a, a shaft down and you'd work out all the coal and then you'd have to move. So the Ifton Colliery moved quite a, quite a distance down towards the west, following the seams of coal, which here are at quite an angle. If, if, if you know Lanham on a Kill, you know what the angle of the, the hill is. That's the angle at which the coal seams dive down underneath the uh, the North Shropshire Triassic rocks, uh, and this is at the edge of it. So it crops out in the, um, this is sort of, it's not actually the Cariog, but it's a tributary of it to the left. And you can actually see the, the seams coming out in that, uh, that cliff there. Um, but the, the Ifton went down for oh, 1500 feet, a long, long way. Um, and the men had to to go down and work in the, the dark and the damp for a long, long time. And in fact, Ifton Colliery finally died, not just because of the change in economics and the, um, the drop in demand for coal, but because they opened a new seam at the bottom, uh, which the older miners knew was dangerous because the big hazard with coal is that it gives off volatiles that are often quite poisonous, carbon dioxide and um, methane and so forth, uh, and they catch fire. And these miners knew this would happen, and indeed it did. 
So there was a mighty great big fire. And that, along with industrial unrest, finally did for Ifton Colliery. But, carry on, okay. yes. Oh, here's another view from the, 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 the heyday view and what's there now, basically. Um, and in fact, the, the colliery died 50 years ago, or just 52 years ago, I think it is now. 62. Now, years ago. 62. Oh, 62. Sorry, can't do my maths. That site is now occupied by an industrial estate, as a lot of them are. And the coal tip, the, there was a big, big tip, we'll see it in a minute, was flattened by the um, authorities and is now a nature reserve called Ifton, Ifton Meadows. Uh, you're in the wrong place there, Charles. It's, it's there. This is, this is Ifton Meadows. If you haven't been there, it's well worth it. It's rather nice and it has wonderful views of the Denby Hills. Which we'll see. Which we'll see. Okay, this is the... Ifton still has a real feel of being a coal village. There's something about it that tells you it's a it's a coal village. It's it's where you kind of smell the the coal history. It still have it has its miners' welfare institute there, and 50 years from closure, this rather nice um, uh, miner was um, sculpted in the iron, and he set, he stands just the other side of the miners' institute. And you can, the old miners can sit on this bench and remind themselves of their days being wound up and down these dangerous shafts, if they want to remember it. And there you see on the bottom right, bottom left is the site of the colliery, which is a very undistinguished industrial estate, which if you didn't know, you wouldn't know was, had been a, a coal mine. And there on the right, there's a very nice walk through this nature reserve. Um, and the, the spoil tip was landscape, starting in the early 70s, I think, um, by the um, county council, was yeah, it? it was yes, there. it was county council, Shropshire County Council. And the height of the trees tells you how old it is, because they're, they're growing up quite quite well now. But there on the left, you know, that, that is the view at the time. So you can see how huge these coal tips were. There may even be people in my own audience now who remember this but uh, I've only been in Shropshire for nearly 20 years and known it for 50 but and I didn't know never came to Ifton I didn't even know about the Ifton um the the nature reserve but this is this is the view from it it's still fairly bare because it takes a long time for the ground to recover to any extent and you only have to scratch the surface and you'll find these bits of coal which I have shown you and there, there are some trees planted in the 70s that are growing up quite well. And there's a wonderful mosaic here, which uh, commemorates a lot of the uh, organisations that uh, existed based on the coal mine, uh, miners' institutes and so forth. OK, we'll leave that. Going south, we hit the, the Oswestry area and the Mordor area. And up on the um, Oswestry Hills, to coin an example, um, there were a number of these bell pits. It was being mined for many years. They knew that the mines, that the coal was not far beneath the surface. And if you look at the bottom right, this is the method it was mined. Um, it's a, very crude. You'd simply dig a hole, dig, 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 um, fashioning a sort of ladder to get down until you hit the coal seams. And then you would hollow it out, filling your baskets as you go, and poor slaves at the top would be winding, winding the coal back up. And you would do that until, really, you couldn't get any further laterally. It was all impractical. And then you'd, you'd put the spoil on the surface, and then you'd move on and dig another hole. And that's the sort of mining that was carried out to, for centuries and centuries on a fairly small scale, very much a cottage industry. This would just provide coal for local houses and people would, would have small holdings and, and farm when they're not um, digging. So it was a sort of buy, buy industry. 
right up to the end, really, although there was this one or two fairly big collieries, actually, at Trevonan, and the village has now commemorated them. Within the last few years, they've put up this uh, rather nice uh, display board and um, landscape the tip. And here you see this rather strange thing is actually representation of a miner mining in the old colliery. Uh, the roofs was the, the seams were very narrow, and to avoid doing too much work, they would just work out the the coal and and leave the overburden or the other things. So it was absolutely backbreaking work, lying down. Um, horrible, horrible, but that's how they worked out on these mines <coughs> as represented. And there are one or two mine shafts here, which of course now are health and safety have insisted and properly protected because actually the Oswestry Hills are riddled with these little mine shafts all over the place and once you get your eye and you see all these tumps and humps in the um, landscape which are where they were bell pits, Gronwyn and Sweeney Mountain and so forth. So quite interesting and go back a minute go back sorry if you can um i can recommend you if you want to know more to go on this website the Oswestry borderland heritage um because there's a very very comprehensive research done by this society on the um the the coal mines of the Oswestry hills uh and I, particularly because one of our members wendy clues was a big light in it um so it's worth going on that if you want to know more or live in that area. OK, move on. All right. Um, oh, yes, this is another side by side image from an old map which shows all these little shafts. And where that ring is, is where the old the old um, colliery was. Um, and you can see the playing field. And to the right is this this um, landscape tip. And you can see little humps with often with trees on them down at the bottom here you can see where the Trevonin cottage was well you'll pick out the shafts on the old maps uh, but there's not a lot to see now and you could be well forgiven for not having a clue that there were any um, mines there move on okay yeah okay now we're going to go and look at the Shrewsbury coal field and for my sins, I was completely ignorant of this. So I was actually very excited when I discovered that our parish, which is Kinnerley, far northwest here, not only borders the uh, south end of the Denbyshire coalfield, but it also borders the west end of this curved um, Shrewsbury coalfield, it was called, which outcrops actually in the River Severn next to very close to Melverley Bridge. And I had not a clue about that. Um, but there, there are a number of bell pit type uh, collieries just above Coid Way, which is the on the road from, um, where is it from? Crew Green. Crew Green, Green to Shrewsbury. To Alverbury. Alverbury, that way, yes. And if you look in the fields there, you will see some mounds. Move on. Oh, here's my uh, 1855 picture of that because I like it. <laughs> OK, and here we are. This is a bit closer to show you the, the shape of this colliery. Far northwest, you see the river here, the River Seven winding around. And you can see that the coal seams cross the river just about at, near Melvillina. Probably if you go to the pub at um, Royal Hill, you're standing on a coal seam. So. Um, but this 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 uh, coal field well has been extensively exploited um, over the centuries, and is actually very conveniently placed at, at um, Pontsbury because the mineral um, field, the lead and zinc field, actually abuts onto this. You'll see later when I show you that picture, and the coal from the Hanwood area, um, Ponsford area, was eventually used uh, to power the smelt houses that smelted the lead. Um, so, 
Okay. Move on. Yeah. Okay. These are the, the pit mounds I'm telling you about from the on the road from uh, Crew Green to Alberbury and on to Shrewsbury. You can see these little mounds in the hills. You see them? Those are old coal pits. And there are a lot actually from between there and Halfway House and Westbury. They dot the landscape. So on a rather nice day, we tried to explore this area and took the road from south from Westbury, which goes directly to Pontsbury and passes a village called Astley, which was actually built entirely to um, exploit the coal seams there. We came across this strange thing, which is a sort of circular fence surrounding something, went and investigated and realised this was an old mine shaft, now converted into a cemetery, containing the, um, the, the tombs, not tombs really, of, of local gentry from a big house in, that owned this land in the, in the background. Uh, I've forgotten the name of it now. Right. Yes. Uh, about three or four graves there with the details, relatively modern actually. So we walked around this and below it, here on the bottom left, we found these relics and inside was most definitely coal. So we knew we were fairly sure that was a, a mine shaft and I've since confirmed that that is so. It's quite close to a place called Astley Windmill, which also had a colliery below it, um, which is quite a landmark near, near Astley. Someone's restored it and rather fine, looking at, across to the um, um, Stiper Stones. Now we get to Ponsford, and if you go to the Nags Head, which is on the east end of Ponsford, there's a pub, this pub here, actually has a display board, as you see bottom right, which tells you about the local uh, mine features that survive, because there's a little sort of crop of mines at Ponsford. And these buildings you see here are still extant. The Ponsford Winding House um, of, across a little river and the bottom of the engine house, which is actually built into a cottage. But there are quite a lot of relics to look like. It's worth a trip to just have a look around and, and see that this was a bustling industrial place. I mean, now it's all rural, idle and beautiful, but um, in, in its day, it would have been an absolute, you know, bustle of, of industry. Next, please. And they built here these, um, these smelting works that uh, latterly, towards the end of the life of the coal field, they actually used it to smelt lead from the Snail Beach mines. And the smelt, smelting uh, barns are still there, a long, thin, didn't go in, of course, because they've been reused, but I don't know, but they are quite impressive. So there are lots of things you can find in the Pontsford, Pontsbury area uh, and Astley, um, if you if you are known for it. Once you get your eye in, you start to see these, these humps everywhere and it's, it's fascinating. Uh, below left is the Hanwood Colliery. Now that is was the biggest um, mining village really in that in the Shrewsbury um, coal field, uh, and that was there were a number of, of 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 mines that came and went, amalgamated, closed down. But Hanwood persisted way up into the the nineteen forties and fifties. I think I think it actually. It was a, it was there when when coal mines were nationalised. I think in 1947, uh, and a lot a lot of people were employed. Ascot was nearby, and there you see you know this is 1900. See how many local men were employed in these uh, mines. They also employed young children, which was horrible, and they would have to go into these mines from a very early age. And because they were small, they were small enough to push these strange trolleys in and out of the, uh, the, 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 the tunnels underground. Next, please. Oh, yes, another one of the side by side with Ponsford. And you see 
on the um, Google Earth on the left, you can quite clearly see where these old shafts were matching the ones on the right. Um, this is the nags head at the bottom. What? Oh, yes, another one up there. Yeah. Uh, this is the, the nags head. And in the field opposite, there were some shafts, but now there's absolutely nothing except a, a playing field. So now we move to Hanwood, just up the road. You probably all know Hanwood, which is at the um, point at which the railway, the Welshpool Railway, uh, splits off from the railway that was actually built down to Ponsbury and instantly to, to serve the mines. Um, and there are a number of collieries there. I won't go into details because it would bore you rigid, but a lot of uh, mines there. A lot of mines also in, actually in the boundary of Shrewsbury. Right up, I think, to Kingsland, there was a, a, a colliery. And certainly up to Uffington, just outside of Shrewsbury to the to the east. Um, and there, there's far too much detail to tell you about all of these, but here's a little flavor of the sort of transport that was used. They had pit horses that would actually haul the the um the tubs with with uh um, oh god what's that? I don't know what's happened. Have I just uh probably yeah, um, sorry's sorry put a hand in the wrong place. Apologies. Bear with bear with bear with we'll get back there. Where are we? No Where's bring... there we are handwood yes yes so this is one of the pit sledges I was telling you about the, the little boys and possibly girls, I don't know, used to have to push through the um, tunnels with loaded with coal. Horrible, horrible work. And then, of course, the railways, once they came into existence, they were the way the coals were transported out. And apparently the Hanwood coal was quite well thought of. It was very good coal. And in fact, so good that it was taken to other areas of coal mines in South, South Wales or West Wales. Um, because it was so valued as a good coal. So now there's still some sort of railway rolling stock with with the um, each mine will have had its um, name painted on the side of it. So there we are, there's a bit. Right, okay, we're leaving that one. Now we're going down towards the south of the county. Now I have to admit that because it's such a long way from my area, I we haven't actually visited the wire forest and really there's not an awful lot to see now but it was quite a quite a few collieries down there which are a great um long lasted a long time but but the ones that's so fascinating is clee hill this extraordinary landscape on clee hill um oh here we are there's our old map again shining away with its hand painted forts and its lovely colours. Um, but Tree Hill is famous for the bell pits. I'm sure you all know about this, but it, it's been mined for centuries and centuries, going way, way back. And it's now absolutely littered with these old bell pits, which, if you um, go across the common, I forget what it's called. Um, you can see them in the landscape, uh, all abandoned, of course, and all going back to nature, but they're, they're quite, from an aerial view, very obvious. Um, I put in the one on the right because Titterson Clee is such an extraordinary place, really. That's that's the uh, capping of dewstone, which is quarried in large amounts. It's dolerite. So there was volcanism here, which sort of capped off the... The, the coal and at some point they even mined through the dew stone which must have been terrible because it's very very hard but the coal field's not particularly extensive but has been it, it's left a very very particular landscape quite lunar really worth going if you haven't been up there and the the, the housing there is is rather typical of mining stroke quarrying so on the left we've got the Clee Hill village um showing the housing there very very um exposed place and wind blows across 
but apparently in the olden days, the Clee Hill miners were, had squatter cottages, the sort of cottages that if you could build them in the overnight and get the smoke coming out of the chimney from your newly mined coal, you were able to stay there and were granted smallholder rights. So a lot of people made their living in these um, bleak places, in these squatter cottages over the centuries. Okay, then the, all I can tell you about the wire forest is that there were these, what are you doing? Well, there was a, these four or five quite big mines. Uh, on the left, I think it's interesting. This is a LIDAR image of uh, 17th century coal mines, more bell pits really. And LIDAR can look at the ground through the trees. It's everywhere in the wire forest, of course, you're walking around in the forest. So relics are all lying around among the trees. And there are a lot of what relics. I have been there in the, the past. Uh, and the, I suppose the, the big sort of plus to the wire forest coal field was that it was all serviced by the Seven Valley Railway and several branch lines were built off it to um, collect the coal. And this wonderful thing on the right, which is a method of moving coal around, probably across the River Severn, by these aerial runway, aerial tramways. Okay. And of course, all these, these coal mines had little tramways all over the place, but I haven't gone into detail about that next. Okay, now we get to the big one. Uh, which is the East Shropshire coal field centred uh, on what is now Telford. And this was the important one. Um, on the left, I, I've done this, this painting. I've, I've tried to reproduce the 1855 geological map. This is the main coal field. And the, the important things about this coal field are the fact that you've got these different sections and if you can see from the cutting across the sections, on the left, the coal comes very near the surface. This is the, um, the lower and middle coal measures. Um, the upper pole coal measures have sort of come above the, the, the above ground. They're not there. And they're very accessible from, from the surface. So a lot of open cast mines, and we're looking at the area between Little Wenlock, if you know that, which is just southeast of the, the Rekin, a little rather nice village, um, between there and um, Oaken Gates, I suppose we'd say, all to the west of this big fault, the Lightmore Fault, which has a down throw of about 40 metres. So all the seams suddenly drop down, which you see from the middle section here, the, the seams drop down. And as you go further east in the uh, in the um, the Telford coal field, I call it that for a simple sake, the, the seams get lower and lower, but they're actually very rich. So they have been exploited. And the whole area is very riddled with these faults. So the, the mining was very, very difficult because you'd be following a seam and then suddenly it would stop and you wouldn't know where on earth it was. So um, you'd have to dig another hole or go somewhere else. But there were a huge number of mines uh, eventually in, in this coal field. Um, I've only put on in a number, but perhaps the next one will show. Yes, to the left. It's not very good, I'm afraid. I had to, had to photograph a rather difficult book. Um, but this shows sort of the number of pits in, and, and bear in mind, this is all well before Telford was ever dreamt of. And there were lots of little scattered villages, but it was an intensely rural area before the 18th century. So this was enormous insult, on, um, a sort of hilly area in the lee of the Rekin, but um, looking down in the north to the Weald Moors, the flat, wet Weald Moors. So it's a very strange area, really. But um, it, it, it just became a huge coal mine and iron mines as well, equally important. Iron was found there. And this is where you had the conjunction of the iron and the coal 
and um, limestone as fluxes. On the right, you see this is the extent of the open cast mines to the west of the Lightmore Fault. Lots and lots and lots of them. I mean, a, a large number of, a large percentage of the land was actually just um, mined away, scraped away with these open cast mines until very, very recently, about which more later. To the right, it was much more difficult. Okay, well, we're moving on now to transport in this coal field. And I, I'm absolutely fascinated by these tub boats and these tub boat canals. The landowners in the sort of mid 1700s uh, were aware of the um, arrival of, of, of canal as the canal age. And the owner of, I think it's Lilyshaw Hall, was the brother in law of the Duke of Bridgewater, who built the first canal in Manchester. So he thought, well, if my brother in law can build a, a canal, so can I. And he built to connect some mines at Pave Lane, you see here, to his, um, he had a lot of limestone quarries at Lillishaw. He started to dig the Donnington Canal. Now, these canals are virtually the same as any of the, the canals. And the one on the top is the Shrewsbury Canal, which connects the Shropshire Union with Shrewsbury. Um, but it's very hilly over this area and they didn't want to build a lot of locks that would have taken an awful lot of time and effort so in the um this coal field they devised the idea of having inclined planes so as you see where these lodges are this is where there are there are five or more inclined planes which were just angled the, they built them into the hills and had um, balancing boats. And they only used tub boats on these. These are like the thing on the right for, for carrying oars around. There were no narrow boats. There were no, you know, no mechanical boats at all. But these inclined planes had little sort of carriages which balanced each other. So a full one would come down balancing a, an empty one. Um, and it was all very cleverly done. And each length of these tugboat canals were built by somebody else who owned the land in the in the late 1700s. So we've got the um, the Wombourne Canal, which is the little hooky one here, which linked in via one of these inclined planes to the Shropshire Union, the, the Shrewsbury Canal. So there was a link out into the main system. Um, and then there was a, uh, gosh, what was it called? The Lightmore Canal, oh, the Ketley Canal, with another inclined plane, which most of them linked coal mines with iron furnaces, because all the iron masters had their furnaces in various locations. And they had to be fed, obviously, very greedy for coal. So they had to link them up. So each one of these tugboat canals had a, a good reason for it. And then right at the bottom here, you see at Hay Incline, you could winch down right into this, the River Severn, and that linked with the, with the River Severn. And that's another good reason why this was such an important industrial area, because it had good river links along the River Severn. And, and that's particularly interesting for me, because when I was a little girl, back in the 70s, early 70s, I was a member of the Oxford University Archaeology Society, and we actually came when they first decided to build the Blist Hills um, village. We came and we started the excavation of the inclined plains. So we were probably the, some of the very first people to start re-excavating these by then lost inclined plains. So I remember a very jolly weekend downing a lot of uh, imbibing a lot of beer shall I say in these um, pubs back in the day before they'd really dreamt up Telford they were just dreaming up the Telford um, town commission uh, having a great time doing archaeology on the on the hay incline plain.
Yeah, move on. Yeah, enough of that. Yeah. So there's the, the inclined plane now being completely restored. Well, that's it in its heyday. And these tub boats would have been transported down these hills on their little trolleys or whatever they called them, balancing one another. Impressive stuff. Saved you going up and down locks, which takes a lot of water. And there isn't a lot of water here. Uh, so this was another way of getting up and down. Picture on the right here shows the coal field pre Telford completely. As you see, this was a, a pretty sort of mm, almost clean like landscape with little settlements here and there, an awful lot of um, tips where the coal tips were, and a lot of smoke because these would be the, the iron furnaces. So it was a pretty hellish place, really. A bit like Bedlam in the first, very first picture. So there we are. And the biggest and the only mine I've actually been to go and have a look at the site of is Granville Mine, which was the last one to close in 1967. This is two phases of Granville Mine, which um, actually ended up being very, very deep mine. But it was good coal, good rich coal. And there's an awful lot of coal still sitting down there in the ground, should we ever need it. Um, when they've, I mean, they've decided now to park carbon dioxide down in old holes in the oceans. So who knows? We might yet see Granville re resurge. Um, it actually ended up merging with the, it's another, another, is that on it? The Grand, another, um, another, uh colliery further south i forgot what the name of it but this is an area here which you can go and visit because it's now the granville country park of course themed out of all existence but it does have a length of the old canal one of the old tub boats the like nightmore canal it has the old uh, iron furnace and it has an old tip which you can go up and it's called the top of the world. And you walk through uh, the site of at least three dead collieries with relics still visible. It's quite interesting. Oh yes, you and your side by side, Charles, gosh. Okay. Better now. Yeah. Better now, yes, yes. Okay. Again, this is the Granville Nature Reserve. And here are some, some relics on a walk through this. The, the um, Ruined winding house, pretty impressive, really. Um, and the tugboat canal, all you can see, of course, is just an empty V-shaped depression, but that is indeed one of the 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 main Donington Wood tugboat canal. What are we doing? Moving now. Oh God. Right, carry on. Let's get going. Um, yeah, the top of it, old flattened cold tip is the top of the world, this bench says. It's very um, unimpressive, or was in January whenever I went. But you get a good view of the Rekin and a lot of, of, of uh, woods. And there are all these, just these bits of mines sitting around in the woods. But of course, now wildlife trumps history and the display boards tell you what pretty flowers grow there in the summer and the butterflies and the birds and the bees and all that stuff. Very interesting, I'm sure, but not history. And then lastly of the of the coal, I went west to hit the open cast area, which is a lot more contemporary really, because it hasn't long ceased to be. Um, a good use for coal mines, landfill site. Can't get in there, but you could see the chimneys poking out. So that's just below um, the new works. If someone wants to turn into another theme park, and it's an area with the old mining village and this and that and the other. Next. And here we are. This is in 63. This is what the open cast looked like. Pretty incredible, really. And this is good quality coal. And it was um, mined by the millions and millions of tons, probably sent down the road to the nearest power station, I imagine. It by 63, Buildless, I think. Uh, and here's an aerial view now, or a couple of years ago, of this area. If anyone knows it, 
the um, this is between Little Wenlock, which is sort of just off to the south here. This is the New Works Village. Um, I took myself there hoping to be able to see these open cast, uh, but from the road you don't see anything. I realise now if I'd actually gone through a gate and over a bund, I might have seen something. But all in all, it's all ceased to be now. Move on. Right. Yes. Um, focus on this for a moment, because we're going to talk about contemporary landscape change. This uh, particular area, because only today, I think, I'm well, going to pass recently. over to my planning consultant now, <laughs> who happens to be sitting next to me. The We've of... reached the juxtaposition of landscape change and planning. Because the what you've just seen there, the ringed area, if I can go back, which I can't. Let's try another method. No, no it's not working. Never mind. But the area that was ringed in the last one is is now the subject of a of a, um, a solar farm. So that's that area you should have been able to see circled in the last one. Here's the um the plan from the planning application and as people in telford know the new works solar farm has was refused permission by telford and Rekin, went to appeal and it's just just now being passed by the secretary of state um there's the m the m40 yeah the m54 just is, above it it's just above it but that ain't the whole story not only is that area circled there with the open, old open cast mines, there's another area circled there, which as people in the know will know as the Steeraway solar farm as well, which has just been subject to its own public inquiry this last week, but the result of the, the New Works public inquiry doesn't hold out much hope for the Steeraway inquiry. So they are actually right bang next to each other. There's the the uh, the slide you had before of of new works, which just sits right next to Steeraway Solar Farm. So the two of them together are past. There will be something like 145 acres of solar farm there. So that's modern landscape change. It's a bit of a slap in the face, really, for a call. Uh, coal mine because uh, change of energy, but uh, of course much nice. cleaner, much much cleaner. Uh, you see that this is the site for sale in so, 1920 in 2022. Yes, so it's been bought, and here of course is modern day Telford. What became of uh, the industrial might of Shropshire is now the commercial might of Scott Shropshire. But we do have the Bliss Hill Mine and the Bliss Hill Victorian Village, which you can go to and pay an awful lot of money and pretend you're back in the Victorian era. So there. Oh, and last but not least. Oh, last for the moment. Yes, last for the moment. Um, iron, extremely important, easily overlooked, but there are actually as many iron mines in the Colebrookdale area as there were coal mines. So there were in 30, 1837, 31 mines producing 500,000 tonnes of iron. So the iron existed not as hematite, which is the sort of richest kind of iron, but iron forms, it's well, I, I really haven't got my head around it. Somebody might be able to help me with this one, but it it forms from percolation of fluids through iron rich rocks, such as the Triassic sandstones and anything that looks red, really. And it precipitated around the coal seams. Um, Often the, the, the coals would be pyritized, there'd be iron pyrites among them. So in one way or another, the coal seams seemed to attract iron, which precipitated into sort of um, concretions, we call them. Famously in this coal field were the, the penny stones, 
which were sort of flat discs of, of iron, often as much as a metre across the, of, of iron ore, not particularly rich, but rich enough to be worth working. And as you see, here's a list of all these different uh, seams of iron, which was associated with coal generally, but uh, worked assiduously um, as well. So the last iron mine closed in 1959, um, and the, the last coal field in 1960 in this part of, uh, uh, apart from the open pass mines, um, when okay. they dreamt up Telford Newtown to reuse all this land. Okay, that's enough of that. Right, so maybe you'd like a break. They have gabbled on for now already, or more than. Um, and this is a hint to the next subject, which is going to be considerably shorter. But if anyone has any burning questions, perhaps they'd like to put them in the chat box now and we'll have a little breather. And you can get your copper kettle and go and make some tea if you like. Get uh, have a two minute break. OK. So we have a two minute break then. Shall, shall we call that five just to allow people to get yes, up? Yes, five. Yeah, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Are there any any but questions? The, the, the rest of the talk is much shorter. It's been coal mainly up to now, and will be the other It'll minerals. The other minerals, yes. Yeah. Copper, lead, etc. So, so come back in in five minutes. Five minutes, lovely. What time, what time do you make that to come back? Shall we say come back at 10 to 9? 10, 10 to 9 would be fine. That, that's, that, I think that's, that's great. Do you know if there are any questions yet? I can see three on my chat thing. Maybe, well, you know, anyone who wants to ask a question. Put one on oh. the chat there about the, uh, the tugboat slide, the one showing the tugboat and the uh, colony. Yeah, canal. I had a... A dickens of a job to get any good pictures of tugboats, but if you go on to um, YouTube, there's a wonderful chap named Andy Tidy, who makes it his business to um, walk these old canals and research where they were. And there's some very, very interesting um, YouTube videos about the tugboats. And a man called Mr. Farnsworth as well who I'm in correspondence with slightly, who's done some wonderful, he's a reverend on with actually. Um, so there is, there is information on the YouTube. Charles, you lost it, put it back, yeah. So, you know, it's a fascinating subject. Okay, yes, okay. Okay, I thought the Shropshire Cave and the Mining Club might pop up. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we've got our expert. I thought we might have. I, I've actually not even been in contact with these people because I'm not about to go down a mine. I don't like mines. Whenever I come to the entrance to these places, I I balk at it. But um, they they like going down and actually experiencing the life of a miner, really. But that's nice. Thank you, Andrew. We'll we'll um, pass that on to anyone who wants to know more. There's plenty, I'm sure. Well, perhaps when it comes to questions at the end. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, can... yeah. Perhaps we can see you in person. So, Sally, do you think that the demise of the mining industry, it must have changed the communities and the, uh, the sort of social mix considerably? Um, totally. Mm. Where have all those miners gone to? Do you have any idea? Well, they've, a lot of them have been re-employed. And these, these, you know, these... Uh, Industrial estates, um, I think, um, a rid sort of in the days of the ore, I'm sure a lot of once the, a coal field was worked out, they would just up and off and get on their bikes. A lot of them would have gone to South Wales, uh, Yorkshire. They'd have just taken themselves off to where there were other mines still in, in, in um, you know, it was a huge, great community. I'm going to talk about that at the end, actually, because it is very interesting, the whole sociology of it. Um, but, um, well, you know, you go to St Martin's now and you can tell the old miners, really. I mean, obviously they're dying out now, but 
and, and it's such an unhealthy occupation that a lot will have died young. But um, yeah, sociologically, it's it changed, you know, gone soft, really. It's the same as Yorkshire, and, you know, the, the, but, but, but are these, they're very resilient, these people, and they found other things to do, I think. Um, it was a hard life, so we, you know, it, it's sort of romantic to say, oh, it wasn't it sad that it all died, but I mean, it was an absolutely terrible life. And as a doctor, I can tell you their lungs were shot away at a very young age, so they're better off not working, really. Um, but it's just a period of history that's, that's gone or going in this country. Plenty of miners abroad, though, Plenty of these terrible practices going on in South America and India and Africa, particularly, as we know. Um, but it, it just must have been a different world completely. And I think any of us over, well, I've hit the great seven zero, but I can sort of remember what it was like when these communities were busy. I went to see Abba Van, for instance, with my dad. And, you know, the, it, it, South Wales was a, a subculture of its own. But um, life moves on, doesn't it? Like landscapes, really. Shall we move on then? Are we ready to? Oh, gosh. Yeah. yeah. Have you all got your cup, cup, copper cup of tea? Because we're going to copper out to copper. <laughs> <laughs> if you're being, first I of all. People might have fallen by the wayside by now, me droning on. But uh, anyway. We're now going to talk about the other minerals that are very prominent in Shropshire. Um, and I'm, I'm just briefly going to say something about mineralization and how these things formed. And the important ores in Shropshire are, of course, lead, particularly um, in, the, in the Snail Beach area, associated with zinc, and then copper in the north of the county, and latterly barites. We don't have any tin at all. Um, and the, the way these ores um, were formed, it's it's all quite debatable. And I see that even in his books, Peter Toghill, who's a famous Shropshire geologist, postulates that there is actually a hot magma source underneath the South Shropshire Hills, which like sort of dark wall that hasn't erupted and is giving rise to the hot waters, the hydrothermal fluids, um, heating them up and sending them up, bearing these minerals, which um, it, it, they do, they solidify in a certain order and it's all to do with their chemistry. And as you go out from a hot body or a hot source, hydrothermal fluids, which have generally just sunk down from the, um, from surface water, but um, I've heard it postulated that the water that gave rise to the minerals in in Snail Beach actually percolated from the, the brines of Shresher, which I find hard to believe because it's a long way off, but maybe, maybe. One way or another, these brines and water pick up these minerals and then find their way back up to the surface and they'll go along any kind of weaknesses in rocks, along faults, um, and they will find their way through certain rocks. And in the Snail Beach area, uh, they're usually carried with, um, uh, associated with quartz and calcite and, and actually barites. And they, they only seem to um, settle in the mitten flags, which are Ordovician rocks which form a certain part of, of, uh, the, of South Shropshire Hills. Move on, Charles, let's see. Oh yeah, I'll just show you these pretty rocks, which I've actually got right here. Here's a nice piece right here. Yeah, oh no. Oh, is that where I have to put it? Oh, good, right. <laughs> Here's a very nice piece of galena. Uh, you can't see it very well. This is, this is lead ore. Uh, associated with zinc, which is sphalerite underneath. The nice lump I found in our house, and I think it's probably because Charles' grandfather was the chairman of Shropshire County Council and may well have been given this lump of ore. 
by his grateful subjects or something. That's only a theory, but there's quite a lot of things like that in our house. So the metalliferous areas. Okay, we can forget the coal now. We have this copper belt in across the uh, middle of the North Shropshire Plain, um, which is rather fascinating. We've also got some copper here, as it, as it happens, that very piece of copper. Here it is. You can't see it really, can you? There we are. Um, that's in the limestone. Um, and it's in a sort of belt and is always associated with faults and with the outcrops of the hills. As, as you know, you know, here and there, North Shropshire has these sort of tors that stick up from the plain, uh, the hills, and it, it, they're nearly always accommodated there, except the far west where I'm going to start, which is Lanamunnock Hill. OK. Move on. Move on, yeah. Oh yes, this is another, I'm afraid slightly out of focus, but these are these are outcrops here. And you can see from the wonderful artist that did these white lines that <coughs> they're always associated with faults. And so they're rather linear. This is a view from Lanamunnock Golf Course looking across the North Shropshire Plain. And this is where these uh, copper mines, copper outbreaks, the main ones are, but there, there, there are lots of them, but these are the ones that were mined. Okay, in the top, that's that's just to show you what utter devastation can occur when copper occurs in large amounts, as it does at Paris Mountain on Anglesey, which was in its day the richest copper seam in the world, produced the most copper, used for copper bottoming ships mainly. Um, and now it's just left as this um, made, amazingly blasted lunar landscape. I think it's been used by Doctor Who, actually. Worth going to if you go to Anglesey, because the, the geology there is to die for. But Paris Mountain is, is fascinating. and hasn't been theme parked, thank goodness. The Copper Far West, has been mined in on Lanamunnock Hill for eons, going back certainly to the Romans, but probably before that. In fact, a housemate of Charles um, from Oxford University or Archaeology Society um, actually did a PhD on Bronze Age bronzes and came and investigated the um, the Lanamunnock Hill, where they found evidence of smelt works going back to the Bronze Age, um, which is amazing. Um, but this old golf is right in the middle of the golf course. I had a bit of a job to find it. It's huge. I'm afraid I haven't got a scale there, but I would be mm, a third of the height of that black bit, and you can walk right inside. You don't actually see any evidence of copper there, but I dare say the the mining, caving and mining bods who are watching this have probably been in there many times and found signs of copper. I found it a bit scary. It's too full of bats and nasty things like that. But there we are. And I was on my own, so I thought it was wise not to go in. Now, this is the Erdiston mine, which is between West Felton and, oh, where is it? Yes, between there and Wrighton. Um, just near Prado House, it used to be um, owned by them, by the Kenyan family there. Great big quarry, huge quarry. Again, I didn't see any real copper staining, but a couple of years ago when I started doing these talks, there wasn't a little white door there, but some dwarf has appeared and slammed a door there. I expect it's the health and safety police. Perhaps the um, caving club could tell me why that that white door is. I didn't dare go in the first time, and now I can't go in. But it may be where all the seven dwarfs live, but I don't know. But that is that was quite a prolific, um, a long-lasting copy of mine. Um, and rumour has it that um, it was kept going with several changes of ownership. Um, and the profits of it went to help build Prado Church, which is a Victorian limestone church um, a few hundred yards away from the mine. But it's most surprising because you, you wouldn't know it was there if you didn't, hadn't been told, but it, there it is sort of hidden in the undergrowth, this 
not much to see, but um, this this quarry. Now we go to Pym Hill, which is the next sort of line of hills along from there, where there were quite a lot, a lot of mines. I uh, walked around there and found absolutely zilch to indicate the mines. I didn't have anyone to tell me where they might be, but I think there is some evidence. Um, um, so that has got a mining history. And then Clive, quite nearby, again, didn't find a thing, but that's because there isn't much to find on the surface. I think there's a manhole cover somewhere. But underground, here we have the mining club. They're having a lovely time down these holes, and there are very extensive uh, tunnels. Um, uh, it was quite a rich mine and earned a, a, a great deal, I think, um, and also hosted other minerals such as cobalt, which is uh, has been used in dyes and so forth. Um, iron staining was found on there, and as you see, there is a fault there, a very um, obvious fault, which is probably the conduit through which the 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 heat hydrothermal fu fluids arrived. Next, please. And the best one is at Hawkston. I'm sure you all know Hawkston with its amazing grottos and walks. But in, in Hawkston, it's absolutely obvious that there are copper deposits because as you go to the Castle Hill at the end, which is the end of a longish walk up and down through these amazing rocks, you can very clearly see this green staining on the on the on the walls of the uh, on the rocks, there we are, green staining, and there is a, a system of caves here, um, which I think is where there was an, an old mine. Um, the walls again, absolutely covered in in deposited copper sulfate, so copper malachite, as you right, um, not now mine, but. Price of copper has gone up, really. So there might come a time when they decide they're going to scrape this off and cook it and make a few copper kettles. Oh, this is just to show you these minerals again. Um, the one on the top left is uh, exhibited at the the wonderful Lapworth M Museum at Birmingham University, which has quite a lot about Shropshire uh, lead mines. So here, the main mineral. Um, or is Galena um, on the right there, this, this uh, dark, shiny mineral with uh, a cuboid, um, what's the word for it? Well, it, it, it solidifies into cubes. Um, and that's sitting on uh, probably calcite, uh, but this mineral barites, barium sulfate, is another of what we call Gange. Um, material that filled these veins and came up and was latterly became the main ore once the galena the, the lead was worked out um barites was was uh, mined in a, a number of mines used as um a filler in drilling rigs to weight them down and for bearing meals um, it's a heavy heavy metal heavy ore Okay, right, this is just to show you where the mines in the Snail Beach area are. So we've moved on to lead now. As you see, the Snail Beach lead field abuts the bottom end of the Shrewsbury um, coal field, very conveniently. So all these mines follow the outcrop of mitten um, flags, these Ordovician shales and slates really, adjacent to the Stiper stones, which is a hard quartzite, which the minerals didn't actually manage to penetrate. So um, there we have a, a number of mines. And interestingly, down at the bottom, you see the bog mine, it's down here. To transport the ores, rather than building a road, because it's very hilly, as anyone who knows the Stiper stones, the, the road from uh, Minsterly up to well, the bog 
they built a five and a half mile long aerial ropeway to carry the oars, which is just now being reconstructed at the Bog Visitor Center, uh, one of the, um, the pylons. So you can see what these things look like. Yes, got a picture, come on, let's go. Okay, here's a geological map of the shelf area. Again, I like my retro maps. At the bottom, you can see that this is all folded and uplifted, etc. And the the host rocks for the, the um, lead are these mitten flags, which come and go. So there are two areas with a gap in between where the mine that hosts the mines. Um, further over the other side of the Pont, famous Pontsford Linley Fault. You get a, a great unconformity. These are much, much older rocks. These are the Long Indian rocks, and they host the Barites in the main and copper. So the last things to mineralize really as these fluids come up towards the surface and cool off. So, and these are just some images of these mines. The gravels mine, quite amazing. One of the biggest mines. It's on the west branch of this. Um, mitten flags outcrop goes back to the Roman times. This is where they found a um, ingot with Roman, with, which said Hadrian on it. So goes back and the, the Romans just sort of carved through the hillside, a great big V. They didn't go down into the earth. They just removed everything. And the gravels mine produced a lot of, of lead. This is well, I don't know when it is, 18 something. Uh, these are all the employees standing at the top of this yeah. strange viaduct, I suppose you'd call it, that, across which the, the oars might have been transported towards a um, tramway or something. Fascinating thing. Um, now, unfortunately, this is all that's left. There's a lot of heaps, really. There's a chimney on the top right. Um, where they would have had the um, possibly smelting or, or crushing. We were there on the day of the Chelton Gold Cup, so we met the Gold Cup winners there, who were bloody nuisance, actually. Excuse my French. Yeah. <laughs> Kept sort of butting us, <laughs> warding us off. Don't you come here messing with us. The bog mine, I'm sure everybody knows where the bog mine is. The turning where you turn left to go up to the Stiper Stones car park. This was some of the buildings in 1910. This is the ropeway that's uh, appearing gradually. That's That wasn't their last time they went. I don't know if they're going to put two there and put a rope between them, but it shows you know, how it must have looked in its heyday. This is bottom left is the Ladywell mine. That's one of the others. But of course, there are lots and lots of mines here. We'll whiz through them because it's a bit don't come. Oh yes, yeah, so this is just an aerial Google Earth view of the Pennerley and the Bog area to show the lasting devastation, really, all the Pennerley buildings and um you know it soured this land on the whole. It wasn't brilliant land to start with, but the remains of the mines of uh, you know soured it a lot of toxic minerals around. And here we have the Snail Beach Mine, which I'm sure you all know, an enormous white tip, which is the Gange material brought up from the mine from which the ores have been extracted. Um, and actually they were remined uh, not so long ago. Um, and all this stuff has been sold as pebble dash. In fact, our house itself is probably covered in this stuff. Um, but that's been completely substantially reduced, but there's still quite a big area of um, uh, old mining stuff. And I found quite a lot of pieces of Galena still in this, uh, this tip that you can go and walk on. And um, bottom left is what it looks like now. Um, I needn't tell you that the whole place has been nicely tarted up, very well preserved, actually, probably by the Caving and Mining Club. I better not insult them because I think they're here, but 
it's it's not a theme park, but it's very nicely done. And you can actually go down the line on guided tours. Uh, although looking at the one on the right, I think I'd rather avoid it. This is what they call a stoke. This is where you actually mine the, the stuff, this gange, down these very awkward fault uh, determined caves, really. Next. In the Tankerville mine, another big mine just up the road. There it is in full production. And on top right, you sort of see the, the veins of, of ore cutting the flags. It's, it's, it's just lying about that. Gives you an idea if you're not sure. This is how the, how the ores come up. And now, it so happened actually on that day that we were, we were doing a hedge planting with CPRE. And I nicked off to go and have a look at this. But the man I'd been working with actually lives in Tankerville Mine. I uh, don't know whether he was um, instrumental in developing these into eco-lodges, but it's now full of eco-lodges and um, holiday houses and things. But it's very impressive. And now, last but not least, I will talk about Barites, which is this Gange material, barium sulfate, which um, itself is a, a, a very useful mineral. And there are a number of mines, Cathacolt, Huglith, um, even the once they'd stopped mining Galena, they moved on to Barites in all of these mines. Um, and there is a, um, you know, there's, there, there's a slight effort to show it off. So as you go along the road from the old turnpike road from Shrewsbury to Bishop's Castle, you'll come across this tub full of whether it's actually varieties or pseudo varieties, I'm not sure, but there it is. And you can walk up a, uh, a path and see the actual site of the mine in this, the seams and a great big round settling tank or something, not quite sure what. That, that millstone thing is a crusher that would have been used to crush the ores. And these mines are you know, employed a lot of people. Um, like the like the uh, the snail beach mine, so the whole area riddled with mines, very big employer, um, folk memory of it, I suppose. Now, move on. Right. We're getting right. Well, that's really the the end of it. There are there are other minerals, but I'm not going to talk about them tonight because we've had enough. Limestone, particularly lime, but I regard that more as a building stone. So I'll talk about it next year, but. Um, let's just have a think about the pros and cons of the legacy of mining in Shropshire. Um, obviously, the cons, as you see, we, we've, we've raped irreplaceable resources, particularly with coal, damaged the ground, poisoned the soil, polluted the groundwater. Our um, chairman, Susan Lockwood, has much to say about that, being a councillor in Minsterley. Um, where the groundwater is still very polluted with lead. And we know what happened to the Romans, so you know, we're going to go because of, co of coal, but uh, the Romans bit the dust because of lead, and it still has to be thought about. Clearly dangerous wine shafts and subsidence, which is a big problem in many places. You know, sinkholes suddenly open up. Um, and the loss of local employment. And then I don't know whether you call it a pro or a con, but of course, sociologically, the wines gave rise to um, unionism, um, collective bargaining. The Labour Party really grew out of mining communities. Uh, but then there's miners' welfare, um, Salvation Army, that sort of thing. So it's a mixed blessing, but it certainly changed the politics of the country. And we know all know about the miners' strikes and all that. And the way Mrs. Thatcher just slammed the lid on it and closed them all down, for better or for worse. Pretty much the worst for a lot of people. The pros, of course, we've got new building sites, nice new playing fields and golf courses, lots of golf courses. Uh, cultural memories, colliery bands, Ifton, 
Well, you can read the same as me, but uh, in spin-off industries, we're better, we're healthier. I mean, miners are, mining's very unhealthy. Lots of dialect words, folk music, lexicon, that sort of thing. Wealth, well, we've got our church at Prado. And having visited Brazil a few years ago, you can see what mineral wealth can do. The, the town of Uru Preto in Brazil is amazingly beautiful, uh, all built on the, the profits from the, the, from the rich minerals of Brazil. Minas Gerais. Mining clubs and caving clubs. There we are. Um, a local history society, people who collect fossils and rocks like me. And of course, tourism. We've got the museums and the theme parks and the Victorian villages and mine tours and all that as a legacy. And sometimes you can reuse these mines. Certainly they uh, do in the continent. You can grow mushrooms and cheeses and reservoirs for this, that and the other. So, you know, that's what you do. But the biggest legacy of the lot Maybe. Maybe. Is it going to work? Is he going to work? Yeah. yeah. We're all, of course, boiling frogs. Global warming. Thank you, coal. When you think how much coal was burnt in the past two centuries, this is why we're in big trouble and we're all boiling. Slowly but surely. So... Right, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> Might put my minus hat on again so I can think. <laughs> okay. It's going to be silence. There we are. Right. Let's see whether there are any more questions. Any more questions? Sally, do you think with the increasing um, international cost of mining and minerals, and, and I'm not thinking of coal here but do you think there's any chance of um, mines reopening across Shropshire for some of the minerals? I'd be surprised but it does seem at the moment that globalization has sort of had its day hasn't it or showing signs of having its day uh, and certainly the um, Ukraine war shows that we're not secure um, and the price of certain things going up until someone finds lithium, which I don't think they're going to in Shropshire, I'd be surprised, but never say never. There's still a lot of stuff left in the ground and the copper, I mean, they do sort of slowly reform these ores. So who knows? I, I, I mean, yes. Possibly, yeah. but uh, I don't think now, but in a hundred years, maybe. Well, is everybody is everybody arriving? Oh, good. Put on your you can put on your um your faces if you like and ask some questions. What well, one question in, one question in the chat because you mentioned um fire clay. Was there ever brick making in Shropshire? Yes, That's there was indeed. Martin yes, yes, Martin Steer. Yes. yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, I didn't talk about fire clay. But that's another very valuable, otherwise known as Ganister and um, Seat Earth. There are all sorts of names, but these are the sort of clays that the trees that form coal grew in and have special properties. They're very refractory. So, yes, brick making was certainly a, a big industry as well, but I didn't quite include that in minerals, really. But it's too much to bring. We've got mm -hmm. a question from MNZ Robbins. You just need to unmute yourself. Oh, hello, Zia. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's sorry. Mike. Sorry. I'm asking oh, the Mike, question. Yeah. Or I'd make you a comment, actually, because um, pre-COVID, uh, the caving and mining uh, organisation uh, used to take parties down the copper mine at Clive. Yes. And, uh, which was absolutely fascinating. And I would recommend anybody who has the opportunity, if they're still doing it, to try and go and see that because you you walk under the ground and you sit you walk under the churchyard and uh, and various yeah. other places and they have a lot to say about it and explain yeah. the copper mining yeah. process. Yes, you've done it, I presume, then, Mike. Have yes, you? I have. Yes. Yes, I, I'd love to, but well, I I wouldn't mind as long as 
are with someone. Right. But you have to be. Yes. Yes. You need to be Andrew, roped up. Andrew, I think, is a big a big uh, authority on these things. So maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more, Andrew. Can you? Regrettably, we can't. <clears throat> we can't do it anymore because the insurance doesn't cover members of the public anymore. Uh, oh, um, I thought we heard that. Yes. And uh, we we would happily take people in. We used to, but uh, uh, the insurance that covers us is through the british caving association and it piggybacks off mountain rescue and uh, the there have been some substantial claims from mountain rescue which has created difficulties with us getting insurance and one of the uh, one of the drawbacks is that um, it's now very difficult to take members of the public into uh, old mines Snail Beach is a slightly different matter because Snail Beach is, is a show mine and it is classed as a working mine and it comes under the health and safety executive and the mine inspector and there are all sorts of hoops you have to jump through but Snail Beach has done that. Clive for example is a private mine owned by the local estate and it's not in that happy position. Um, so I'm afraid we can no longer run trips to Clive, although it is a most fascinating place to visit. I'm likely to be there next week. Well, well, thank you for that. Yes. Um, I'm sure, you know, that you could have given us a much more authoritarian chat. And authoritative. Authoritative chat <laughs> talk. But I have to bear in mind I'm talking mainly to CPRE people. So landscape is really our topic um the, it can be a bit difficult to wind it into this uh, subject but um anyway done my best yeah. it's been absolutely fascinating going around all these mines and looking at them and considering them and uh, i recommend to anyone just get out there walk around investigate look out for old coal pits and coal mounds and once you get your eye in you'll see them all over the place take your 1855 geological map with you because uh, that's where they are yes andrew if you go on the shotshire caving and mining club website you'll find a lot of good information i mean most okay. of what you've said you've got basically right uh, i Noticed a number of small errors. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> most of the gravels mine photographs are not actually at gravels mine, they're at wood mine. Oh. And the, the uh, mine you showed as Cothercott mine is actually Wilderley Copper Mine. But uh, there are a few minor things, but most, most of it you've got basically right. <laughs> there are great lumps of varieties in the uh, tub there. It's concrete. Oh, they in, oh the the in at the um at the entrance at Colicott, yes that tub it does have varieties in it we've deliberately collected varieties it's concreted in to stop mm. fossickers oh yes yes pinching the mineral um but it is genuinely varieties it's not all mined at Colicott. Uh, it was oh. wherever we could find some suitable varieties a lot of it came from snail beach oh okay that, that's actually the processing plant Covercott mine, and there, there are, there's more than one of them, is over the hill. And you can, the path you walked up is the line of the old tramway. You will have seen it on the interpretation yes, panels yes. that we put in. And if you walk round over the hill down to the other side, there are some open workings there that you can look into. Oh, okay. But what's the great big round pond there? It was a reservoir for Wilderley Copper Mine. Oh, okay. Yes, um, I didn't mention that there were copper mines that side, but well, I did briefly mention it. But the, the, the long, there, are, there are shows of copper all the way down the west side of the Long Mind. Yes. And yes. a number of places, copper has been mined, but mm -hmm. none of it was actually economic. Mm -hmm. And the Wilderley mine is an interesting case in point. If you can locate a copy of, I think it's account number eight or nine of the uh, Shropshire Caving and Mining Club. There is a, a quite a lengthy and detailed article about uh, Wilderley. Oh, okay. We, we My great apologies. I mean, bear in mind, I'm coming from this 
from a position of fair ignorance, um, but I've found it extremely interesting for the last three months. And uh, we've, we've got a hand up from Sue and Martin. Um, yeah. Take, please unmute me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Sorry, yeah. That, uh, abs absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. We've oh, enjoyed the Martin. other talk. But uh, um, yeah. just uh, an interesting one, as you know, we're um, underneath the Brown Clee, uh, mm -hmm. Abdon, but the Foundation for Common yeah. Land um, has just, they've been doing archaeological work. Um, last year they did the Abdon, um, the, the hill fort, but this time they've uh, excavated some of the bell pits and done oh, some yeah. work and they're presenting that very shortly and I'll try and send a a link to it. They're having a, a talk in the village hall in Cleese St Margaret um, shortly oh, um, about yeah. about about the bell the bell pits. And I I think the coal mining up there stopped in about 1927. But I was asked to answer yeah. a question and I haven't, so I apologise. But thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> we did actually once we've been to Titterstone, we did drive right round Brown Clee on that road that goes. And I, I didn't really go any, I didn't, we were too lazy to walk up to the top, but <laughs> I know there was, you know, there was quite a coal industry up there on the Brown Clee. You see quite a lot of disturbance to the left of the road as you go round. So, mm. oh, just, oh no, there you are. Um, and, and wasn't there a, a runway down to Ditton Priors? Yeah. Yes, there was an aerial uh, roadway. Yeah. And there, it, yeah. there is a little museum in Ditton Prior, which I think is open on a Saturday morning uh, by the Willows Cafe in, in these oh, concretely oh. made. And it, there's, there's actual parts of the rope and everything up there. Interesting. But oh, anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, the, the... more to do. Yes. Well, <laughs> yes. It's it's a fantastic way of spending three months, the first three months of the year, preparing these talks because it gives me something to do. So yes. But I should go back there because uh, well, our past president, as you probably know, Sarah Berry lives in Tugford. So um, you know, we sort of focus on that area sometimes. We've got another question from uh, MNZ Robbins. Yeah. I did. Oh, I did actually type a question earlier, but obviously it's been missed. Oh yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the um, of Hanwood, the colliery there. Um, they have the the tramway. Actually, the horse was called, I believe, a uh, Curly, not Charlie. <laughs> and oh, but he's Curly. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but they used to tow. Well, that's what I from the search I did on that because I, mm -hmm. I used to ride all around there, and they he used to pull it down the tubs down to a wharf. It said. Now, would that have been a wharf? I think there's not a canal there, so the wharf would be on the railway. Would it? it must have been the railway, I think. I don't. And there know were brickworks at Arscroft there as well, so the brickworks all went sort of with it. Andrew knows. In life, yeah, but no, went they went from Moat Hall to Arscroft the the tramway. Uh, there, are, there are a number of mines around there. Hanwood was connected underground to Moat Hall Colliery, which yeah. is on the Pulverbatch mm -hmm. Road. Uh, and the, the landowner that owned that merged it with Hanwood. And the screens were at Cruck Mill. And I think what you're talking about is the tramway that took the coal from the actual shaft at Hanwood across to the screens at Cruck Mill. And at Cruck Mill is where the uh, brickworks was. There was a big brickworks there. There are, there are plenty of available photographs if you know where to look. Um, and in fact, there's a, the, where you go under the bridge at uh, Hanwood, there's a big spoil heap just opposite the school. Um, oh, and yes, the, yeah. the shaft was, was sort of behind that. Um, so the, the tramway took the trucks of coal along sort of between the railway and the road and uh, at Cruck Mill you go over a bridge and there are some stone parapets on this bridge I can't remember oh. what it goes over and on the east side of the bridge you can see grooves worn in the stone of the parapet those grooves were worn by the cable that pulled the trucks up and tipped them into the screens. Ah. So next time you go wharf? down there, have a good look. Yeah. Where was the wharf then? What were they unloaded them into? Is it was the water the uh, the river there, or or was it? No, no. It, the 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 coal was 
and load it into screen. So they'd screen it into different sizes and qualities. Right. And then it, it mostly went out by train. Right, um, that's a railway, yeah. So one of one yeah. of the interesting things is a lot of the uh, coal mine owners uh, helped fund the railway because they were con the, the Minsterly branch, that is, on the grounds that it would help them to sell their coal out into the wider world. But the, the law of sod took over and much higher quality coal could come in more easily from Staffordshire and places. It actually helped the decline of the Hanwood coal mines. Mm. And they actually closed, I think, in 1948, not long after nationalisation. Mm. Right, thank you. Mm. Any, any more questions from anyone? More in those, no, not, not even from the, I can see that we've got some genuine miners on the call still. Or yes, I will just companies. give a, I will just give a warning to anybody Martin. walking around the Stiperstones area, because I was taken there on a an a, a official trip and we're talking to a farmer and he said he was driving across his field and his whole tractor disappeared down the hole. And so oh, there are also yeah, un, 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 <laughs> un, unmarked ones. So just if you're anywhere off, don't go wandering too far off tracks because it you could just, uh, it's um, no, there are awful lot oh, of unknown it, ones. It happens. I think, I, think, I think these miners down here are wanting to ask a question, are they? There's a, a bunch of miners, I think, aren't there? Are they? Under Martin? No, they're muted. But they're they're sporting mining gear. Are these your your colleagues, Andrew? Can you see them? Yeah, they're waving now. <laughs> Who are they? <laughs> Don't know. Oh, well, they're making the evening of it. So they've got their their tinnies or something, and sure. I'm wondering who they could be. You have lost quite a few people, but we Don't still. Do you mean me? Twenty. Uh, Roger, Roger Gosling wants to speak. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's also, he's also got some mining equipment in the back. There. Yeah. Sorry, did you mean me? I, I wasn't waving on purpose. I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, no, no, it's a, it's a gang. That, oh, they've got um, the hand up now. Martin, Martin. Okay. Oh, you've unmuted. Martin, who are you? Are you the seven dwarves? <laughs> nope, they're still mute. Mute. Never mind. Never mind. What's that funny noise? Is that my frog? No, no, it's... I think it's my frog boiling. Oh. Maybe we've reached the end. Maybe we've reached the, oh. the end of the mine. Well, if we have no more questions, let me give a big thank you to Sally and Sally's able assistant who's pressed the buttons, uh, Charles. Um, <laughs> Not a great, always. A great talk, Sally. Uh, we've all learned a lot. I've certainly found out an enormous amount about coal mining, which I didn't know at all. So no, uh, I, I was pretty ignorant before I started this. And can I just implore people to get out there if you don't know these places, go out there when the weather warms up and, and just have a jolly good look because it's absolutely fascinating. You must, uh, you must consult Andrew Wood first because he knows everything and he'll tell you everything. Do you lead, do you lead conducted tours, Andrew, or anything now? Oh, he's gone silent. Sorry, beg your pardon? Sorry? What was do the you, question? Do you lead tours or walks among the mines anywhere? Um, we certainly lead tours at Snail Beach. Mm -hmm. um, the, the club does uh, run club member tours, all sorts of places. Not long ago, that we visited Billingsley Colliery, for example. Oh, yeah. um, th there's, there's all sorts of stuff that we do, and we have a number of mining historians in the club. So there's all sorts of stuff we do. If people are interested enough in mines, they can always join the club. Yes, well, we don't want to lose CPRE members to your club. No, we can. But we can be members of both. The plenty of people are members of. Many we can be members of both, but but you know, I, I'm just you know, exhorting people to go and go and look at these places. Very very interesting, and and so much better when you know about their history as well. 
So I've certainly enjoyed it and found out a lot. You should bear in mind a lot of these things are on private land, so you need to be a little bit careful where you're going. Well, you do anyway, or you'll fall down mine yeah. shafts, but it is, yes, yes, go with someone who knows. But anyway, next year, I do them once a year, that's quite enough for me. Um, I intend to have a good look at all the quarries in Shropshire and all the building stones and perhaps lime. I haven't gone into the details of lime, um, which is another very important substance uh, which we excel at with a lot of lime rocks in this county. So I hope I'll see you all again. But thank you very much for coming. And thank you, Andrew, for so ably comparing things. Not at all. And thank you, Sarah, for organising it all. Um, yes. And thank you, thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I think, hope you've all learnt an enormous amount. Yeah, hopefully. Okay. If, if, you, if you missed anything, I don't know if I can alter anything now in retrospect, but it will be going on YouTube. So a few, few untruths will go on to YouTube, I'm afraid, Andrew. But, um, you know, that's the way, you know, what do they call it, oral traditions form a few untruths. Oh, look, there's Susan. Yes. OK. OK, we should leave you now. Then. Yeah, I have a very troubled cat here because he can hear your voice and can't figure out where you are. <laughs> oh, Sally and Charles know. gave me my kitten. <laughs> and he's just going around the table going, where are they? <laughs> uh, yeah, Susan, yeah, yeah. we've got our first lamb this morning. Would you like a little oh. black lamb to go with the cat now? No, I don't think I don't think I could cope with that. <laughs> it's a very sweet lamb. It's about the oh. same size as the kitten. Or your great big thumping cat now. <laughs> yes. I'll, have, I'll come and see it. <laughs> yes, do Thank that. you both. Thank you so okay. much. Well, see you again then. Yeah. Bye. Bye now. Thank you for attending, everyone. Thank yeah, you, Andrew, thank you. as well. Yes. Very Thanks ably compared. Bye we'll, now. We'll come and invade Herefordshire next year. <laughs> Bye. Good night.